Akne Bolpen Yani Morning, Fina. Morning, sir. Morning, Rico. This is Deng. Morning. Hi, Deng. Deng. <laughs> Din, din morning, Dayan. I did not see Dayan. Good morning, Din Deng. Hi, wonderful to see you. I cannot can see you. Ma Good morning. I am Michael Chu from the UP College of Law and the UP Law Center Institute for International Legal Studies. And I'm Fina Tantuiko representing the George Malcolm Foundation. We will be your host for today. Our Malcolm lecture today is entitled Understanding the President's Treaty Powers, Tenant Concurrence and Vested Rights under the recent Pangilinan versus Cayetano ruling, a timely webinar on the recent decision resolving petitions that challenged the withdrawal of the Philippines from the Rome Statute without the concurrence of the Senate. Before we turn the floor over to our guests, allow us to recognize the organizers of this webinar, this Malcolm Lecture, the UP College of Law, the UP Law Center Institute of International Legal Studies, and the Justice George Malcolm Foundation. With us today are the heads of these institutions, Dean Carlo Vistan, and UP ILS Director Romel Casas and of course, former Senior Associate Justice Antonio T. Carpio, who is the Chair of the Malcolm Foundation. On behalf of the organizers of this forum, we wish to acknowledge the presence of our esteemed guests this morning. May I start with uh, UP President and former College of Law Dean Professor Danilo Concepcion, if he is in. The trustees of the Malcolm Foundation, led by former Ombudsman and Supreme Court Associate Justice Conchita Carpio Morales. Justice Chit is trying to get in. Former Commission and Audit Chair, Attorney Grace Polido Tan. Morning. Former Secretary of National Defense and President of the UP Law Alumni Foundation, Attorney Abelino Nonong Cruz Jr. Former UP College of Law Dean and Professor of Constitutional Law, Pacifico Agabin. College of Law Dean, Carlo Vistan, who sits in the board ex officio. I regret that one of our trustees cannot be with us this morning. He happens to be the ponente of the case we will be discussing. And I refer to none other than Supreme Court Associate Justice and former Dean of the College of Law, R. V. Leonin. We also have with us this morning as special guests, our former Malcolm trustee, our beloved professor of constitutional law, retired Supreme Court Justice Vicente V. V. Mendoza, Good morning, sir.
the former holder of the Malcolm Professorial Chair in Constitutional Law, former ICC Judge and UP College of Law Dean, Professor Raul Pangalangan. And of course, the Director of the Institute of Human Rights of the UP Law Center, Professor Beth Pangalangan. With us also this morning is the President of the Philippine Bar Association and Professor of Constitutional Law at the Ateneo, our very own alumnus, Attorney Rico V. Domingo. Good morning, everyone. We also acknowledge the presence of our beloved former UP College of Law Dean, Fides Cordero Tan. Morning. Mike, do you have other guests you wish to acknowledge? Yes, thank you for that, Fina. I do want to acknowledge uh, our professors who are here, the members of the faculty. So far, we have professors uh, Bagilat, Tamase, Oyales, Professor uh, Beth Pangalangan is also here, Professor Espinilla, Ortiz, uh, Associate Dean Solomon Lumba, Professor Dizon Reyes, Villarreal, Luanzon, and Maliari. Welcome, uh, professors. So, Fina. I know that you are a senior lecturer here at the UP College of Law, and at the same time, you're also the secretary of the trustees of the Malcolm Foundation. Perhaps you could give us all a brief profile of the Malcolm Foundation and the Malcolm Lectures. Gladly, Mike. I will try to be as brief as I possibly can. What I will recount, I came to know through the late Supreme Court Associate Justice Amorfina Herrera, who I clerked for right after passing the bar in 1989. She is a goddaughter of Justice George Malcolm, the UP College of Law's founder and first dean. The year was 1960. Justice Malcolm came back to the Philippines during the Golden Jubilee of the college and entrusted 10,000 pesos to his favorite students, Alejo Labrador, Gonzalo W. Gonzalez, Enrique M. Fernando, Amorfina M. Herrera, and Vicente Abad Santos. These favorite students of Malcolm later rose to prominence, either as practitioners or as associate justices of the Supreme Court. Justice Malcolm wanted this gift to be used in financing a chair in constitutional law, a field he distinguished himself in during his lifetime. The gift became known as the Malcolm Trust Fund, and with it, the Malcolm Professorial Chair in Constitutional Law was established by the UP Board of Regents in April 1961. To provide additional funds, not only for the chair, but also for other projects of the College of Law, the original trustees with the addition of Emilio Abello, Deo Gracias T. Reyes, Alexander Sisip and Rafael Salas later established Malcolm Trust Fund II. This fund was raised from contributions of friends and admirers of Dean Malcolm. Mr. Washington Sisip was designated by the board a successor trustee to attorney Alexander Sisip, who passed away in 1975. The first holder of the chair was Florentino P. Feliciano, who decades later became Associate Justice of the Supreme Court in 1986. Justice Feliciano is a revered name in so far as international law is concerned. He co-authored several books on international law with Yale professor and renowned scholar in international law, Yale professor Myers McDougall. Justice Feliciano was also a lecturer at the Hague Academy of International Law. These are just a few of his many distinctions. Chief Justice Fernando was appointed Malcolm Professor of Constitutional Law in December 1975, and he held the position for many years. His last Malcolm lecture, which was also the eighth centenary lecture in the Supreme Court centenary lecture series, was held in 2001 on the topic a century of constitutionalism, the mission as per Malcolm J, and its fulfillment as per Laurel J. Other selected professorial lecturers also delivered Malcolm lectures, among them then assistant professor Antonio G.M. Lavinia, 
who gave a lecture on environmental law. Also, then Professor May Lucereno, prior to her appointment as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, she spoke on the topic autonomy and secession, a constitutional law review of the process and content of the GRP MILF negotiations. The trustees of the funds organized the Justice George Malcolm Memorial Foundation in 2012. The SEC approved its registration in August of 2012. The first set of trustees of the foundation were retired Supreme Court justices, Amorfina Melencio Herrera, Florentino P. Feliciano, Vicente V. Mendoza, Renato S. Puno, Washington Sisip, former UP College of Law Dean Pacifico Agabin, and then Supreme Court Associate Justice Antonio T. Carpio. The foundation was formed to foster and promote studies and continuing interest in constitutional law, to aid in financing a professorial chair in constitutional law, and to administer the Malcolm Funds. The first Malcolm Lecture of the Foundation was delivered on January 31, 2013, by then former Dean Raul C. Pangalangan, as holder of the Malcolm Professorial Chair, prior to his appointment as judge of the International Criminal Court in 2015. He spoke on the topic, Counter-Majoritarianism and the Populist Backlash in Philippine Constitutional Law. So there, Mike, in a nutshell, is a backgrounder on the Malcolm Foundation. The names associated with it sound like a who's who in constitutional law and international law, the subjects we are going to deal with this morning. Aside from the professorial chair, it would interest you to know that the foundation also administers the Malcolm scholarships given to students who obtain a grade of 1.75 or better in constitutional law and other political law subjects. Indeed, very interesting, Professor Fina, especially for those of us who belong to the younger batches. Listening to the history of the foundation certainly make us proud uh, of our alumni. Yes, indeed. So now let us proceed to open today's substantive discussion with remarks from the chair of the Malcolm Foundation. He graduated as class valedictorian, cum laude, of class 1975, ranked sixth in the bar exams, founder of the Carpio Villarasa and Cruz Law Firm, professorial lecturer of the UP College of Law, appointed chief presidential legal counsel by then presidential president Fidel V. Ramos, and in 2002, appointed associate justice of the Supreme Court at the age of 52, where he sat for 18 years, achieving the rare feat of having zero backlog during his retirement. Public servant and champion of Philippine sovereign rights, ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Supreme Court Associate Justice Antonio T. Carpio. Good morning to everyone. Welcome to this webinar on a very important recent decision of the Supreme Court. The Pangilinan versus Cayetano decision, a unanimous Supreme Court decision penned by Justice Marvick Leonen, says that, and I quote, a treaty cannot amend a statute, end of quote, while at the same time declaring that a treaty is, and I quote, transformed into domestic law by Senate concurrence, end of quote. Prior Philippine jurisprudence says a treaty concurred by the Senate has the status of a law. In Secretary of Justice versus Lanchon, the Supreme Court declared that, and I quote, a treaty may repeal a statute and a statute may repeal a treaty, end of quote. The Pangilinan decision now says that while a treaty is transformed into domestic law by Senate concurrence, the concurred treaty cannot amend or repeal a prior inconsistent law unlike a law passed by Congress. Under the Pangilinan decision, in case of conflict between a prior statute and a later concurred treaty, the prior statute prevails. Thus, under the Pangilinan decision, a concurred treaty is not actually transformed into domestic law because by definition, a later law amends or repeals a prior inconsistent law. If a concurred treaty cannot amend or repeal a prior inconsistent law, then it is not transformed into domestic law upon Senate concurrence. 
Under the Pangilinan decision, before the president can enter into a treaty, he must now first verify that the treaty does not conflict with existing law. If it conflicts with existing law, the law must first be amended before the president can sign the treaty. Otherwise, the president will be entering into a treaty in bad faith because he is not authorized to enter into a treaty that conflicts with existing law. He is also bound to faithfully execute the law, including statutes, and he cannot commit that Congress, an independent and co-equal branch of government, will in, will in the future amend the existing law. It seems that the Pangilinan decision even prevents the president from stipulating that the treaty will take effect only upon enactment by Congress of an amendatory legislation. This will bog down and weaken the president's power to enter into treaties. Under the Pangilinan decision, the president's treaty making power has considerably been watered down. In the United States, under Medellin versus Texas, the U.S. Senate concurrence can expressly declare a treaty as self-executing, making the treaty a part of U.S. domestic law, thereby amending or repealing any inconsistent prior law. By holding that the Philippine Senate's concurrence cannot make the concurred treaty prevail over a prior statute, the Pangilinan, Pangilinan decision deprives the Philippine Senate the flexibility that the U.S. Senate enjoys in concurring to a treaty. Under international law, the Philippines will be liable under the concurred treaty, even if the concurred treaty conflicts with Philippine statute. This creates another anomaly. A foreigner can enforce the concurred treaty against a Filipino citizen in a foreign court. On the other hand, a Filipino citizen cannot enforce the concurred treaty against a foreigner in a Philippine tax treaty concurred by the Senate that derogate from the tax code. The effectivity and validity of these tax treaties are now in doubt because they amend or repeal existing provisions of the tax code without Congress enacting any amendatory or repealing law. The Visiting Forces Agreement is a concurred treaty which amends the DILG Act of 1990 by giving custody of an accused American soldier to U.S. authorities from arrest to conviction by the trial court. It is only after conviction by the trial court AFA, even without any amendment of the DILG Act. The Supreme Court in Laude versus Judge Hines Habalde, with Justice Leonen as ponente, affirmed the application of the VFA to the Laude murder case. The Supreme Court ruled in Tanyada versus Angara, which upheld our accession to the WTO, that, and I quote, treaties really limit or restrict the absoluteness of sovereignty. By their voluntary act, nations may surrender some aspects of their power, of their state power, in exchange for greater benefits granted by or derived from a convention or pact, end of quote. Under the Pangilinan decision, a concurred treaty cannot amend or repeal a prior statute, but under Tanyada, a concurred treaty can even surrender aspects of a state sovereignty or state power. The rule has always been that in case of conflict between international law and the Constitution, domestic courts will uphold the Constitution. In short, the Constitution prevails even as the state may become liable to another state for its violation of international law. At the international law level, however, an international tribunal will always rule that the international law prevails over domestic law, including the Constitution of a state. This is a recognized dichotomy in the international law and domestic law. The Pangilinan decision, however, says that since the withdrawal from the ICC has taken effect with the deposit of the instrument of withdrawal and the acknowledgement by the UN and the ICC of the withdrawal, the issue has become moot. This means that a domestic court or supreme, the Pangilinan decision cites with approval the mirror principle that the manner of entering into the treaty should be the same manner in withdrawing from the treaty. In short, since the treaty can take effect only with the concurrence of the Senate, then a treaty can only be withdrawn or terminated with the concurrence of the Senate. Notwithstanding this mural principle, the Pangilinan decision says the withdrawal from the ICC was effective because it satisfied the requirements of international law for withdrawal from the treaty. The Pangilinan decision could have applied the dichotomy between international law and domestic law that under international law, the withdrawal was effective because it satisfied the requirements of international law.
But under the mirror principle favorably cited by the Pangilinan decision, the withdrawal violates domestic law, that is the Philippine Constitution. That would have made the Constitution prevail over international law in the domestic sphere. Under our democratic and republican system, no man is above the law, not even the president. Under our constitutional check and balance system, Congress enacts, amends, or repeals the law, the president executes the law, and the judiciary ensures that acts of Congress and the president do not violate the law. Otherwise, the judiciary will declare the acts of the president or Congress unconstitutional. Under this constitutional setup, the president, using only his executive power, has no authority to abrogate or repeal a law. The Pangilinan decision has changed this constitutional setup. The president is now above the law because he can unilaterally abrogate or repeal a concurred treaty, which the Pangilinan decision admits as a status of a law and is transformed into a domestic law upon Senate concurrence if the majority in the Senate does not make a timely objection before the Supreme Court or if the termination has taken effect under international law, making the issue moot. Thankfully, the Pangilinan decision allows a saving grace. The president cannot make such unilateral abrogation or termination of a concurred treaty if the Senate made its concurrence conditional. So the president cannot abrogate or terminate the concurred treaty without the Senate's consent. This conditional concurrence by the Senate can be given at the time of the concurrence or even after the concurrence through a comprehensive resolution. After the, after the president unilaterally withdrew from the Rome Statute creating the ICC, the Senate the Senate made all its subsequent concurrence to treaties expressly subject to the condition that any withdrawal by the president from the concurred treaty shall be subject to the same concurrence by the Senate. Now the Senate can pass a comprehensive resolution as suggested in the Pangilinan decision that all prior treaties can only be withdrawn or terminated by the president upon the same concurrence by the Senate prior to such withdrawal. This will restore the status quo ante the Pangilinan decision, reaffirming that no man is above the law, not even the president. Unfortunately, such restoration of a fundamental democratic and republican precept will be due to a mere Senate resolution, not to an immutable constitutional principle upheld by the Supreme Court. Lastly, the Pangilinan decision ruled that the issues raised by petitioners were actually mooted by the withdrawal by the president from the Rome Statute and the acceptance by the petitions are the controversy that impels this court's review, end of quote. Thus, while the court still discussed the issues presented, most of the discussions in the Pangilinan decision, including on whether a treaty may repeal a statute and a statute may repeal a statute, are at best obiter. I will end my remarks here as I do not want to preempt our distinguished speakers. I just want to whet the intellectual appetite of everyone to the exciting topic that we will be hearing from our distinguished speakers. Thank you and welcome everyone. Thank you very much, Justice Carpio. Uh, your remarks certainly provide the important context of today's Malcolm Lecture and the ideas that we should keep in mind as we listen to the presentations of our speakers. And on that note, we introduce our first speaker who will give the background of the case. He is Assistant Professor Andre Palacios, who teaches international law at the UP College of Law. He graduated from UP Law in 1998 and placed fifth in the bar examinations. He holds a master's degree in public law committee of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, which was one of the petitioners in one of the cases subject of the Supreme Court decision we are discussing today. He is also the executive director of the ASEAN Law Institute, Previously, he was a senior lawyer at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., and assistant to the Philippine Permanent Representative to the World Trade Organization in Geneva. He also serves as legal expert for infrastructure projects funded by the Asian Development Bank and advises government and private entities on TPPs and infrastructure projects. Previously, he was the undersecretary heading the PPP Center of the Philippines. Professor Palacios, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Mike. May I be allowed to share my screen? Uh, good morning, everyone. 
I am honored to give the background of this important decision by the Philippine Supreme Court. The decision involves the withdrawal by the Republic of the Philippines as a party to the treaty known as the Rome Statute, which established the International Criminal Court. The withdrawal appears to be a simple event. A piece of paper called the Notice of Withdrawal was delivered by a person representing the Philippine government to another person representing the United Nations Secretary General. A piece of paper delivered, done. A very brief event. However, this brief event should be seen as part of a lengthier process that occurred simultaneously on two different planes, in two different dimensions, in two separate and distinct legal systems, in two parallel universes, if you will. The delivery of the notice was part of the withdrawal process under Philippine law. The significance and effects of the withdrawal under the Philippine legal system will be examined by UP law professor Dante Gatmaitan, who is an expert in Philippine constitutional law. Simultaneously, the delivery of the notice was also part of the withdrawal process under international law. The significance and effects of the withdrawal under the international legal system will be examined by Notre Dame, Notre Dame law professor, Dr. Diane Desierto, who is an expert in international law. Hopefully, this brief background, the context of the case, will allow us to have a greater appreciation for the insights of our two legal experts. The treaty from which the Philippines withdrew is called the Rome Statute, so-called because it was in Rome where the treaty the text of the treaty was negotiated and adopted during an international diplomatic conference held in 1998. From the international law perspective or in the international legal system, the Rome Treaty is not the first to define which acts are to be considered the most heinous crimes under international law. Even before the 1900s, violations of the laws and customs of war or war crimes were already considered crimes under customary international law. As early as the 1940s, crimes against humanity and the crime of aggression were already considered crimes under customary international law. In 1948, the Genocide Convention defined the crime of genocide under international law. Also, the Rome Treaty is not the first to require the punishment of the most heinous international crimes. The four Geneva Conventions of 1949, regulating the conduct of warfare, as well as their predecessor conventions, require states to penalize and punish war crimes called grave breaches of the said conventions. Additionally, the Rome Treaty was not the first to establish an international tribunal to fight impunity, international agreement to establish the international military tribunal. This tribunal sat in Nuremberg to try high-ranking government and military officials of the German state. The following year, in 1946, the Allied States, by military proclamation, established a similar tribunal for the Far East. This tribunal sat in Tokyo to try high-ranking government and military officials of the Japanese state. Both were military tribunals created by states that prevailed in an armed conflict for the limited purpose of punishing war criminals in the defeated states. Almost 50 years later, in 1993, the UN Security Council established the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. This tribunal sat in The Hague to try individuals who committed international crimes in the former Yugoslavia during the conflict involving Serbia, Croatia, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. The following year, in 1994, the UN Security Council established a similar. Both were ad hoc tribunals created by the UN Security Council to punish crimes committed during specific armed conflicts. Subsequently, the UN entered into international agreements with Sierra Leone in 2002 and with Cambodia in 2003 to create internationalized courts for international crimes committed during the civil war in Cambodia from the, 19, from the 1970s and in Sierra Leone from the 1990s. In 1998, a diplomatic conference was held in Rome where the text of the Rome Statute was adopted by 120 states. 
The treaty was opened for signature and ratification by states. The Philippine diplomatic representative signed the treaty on behalf of the Philippine state in December year 2000, three days before the deadline for states to sign the treaty. A state's mere signature did, my, did not make that state a party to the Rome Statute. Thus, the Philippines did not become a party to the treaty by its mere signature in year 2000. The Philippines became a party over a decade let, later in year 2011. Nonetheless, though the Philippines was not yet a party to the Rome Statute, the Philippines as signatory already incurred certain obligations under international law. The Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties obligated the Philippines, while still a signatory and not yet a party to the Rome Statute, to refrain from performing acts that would defeat the object and purpose of the treaty. In 2002, the Rome Statute entered into force and the International Criminal Court was created. The treaty entered into force after the 60th state deposited its instrument of ratification. Notwithstanding the entry into force of the Rome Statute in 2002, the Philippines did not become a party and the treaty did not yet enter into force in respect of the Philippines until the Philippines deposited its instrument of ratification in year 2011. From the Philippine law perspective or in the Philippine legal system, the entry into force of the Rome Statute in respect of the Philippines resulted in the domestication of the treaty rules, meaning their transformation into Philippine national legal rules that were part of the law of the land of the Philippines. As part of the law of the land or as Philippine legal rules, the provisions of the Rome Statute created Philippine legal rights as well as Philippine legal obligations that could be invoked before and enforced by Philippine courts and administrative agencies. However, from the Philippine law perspective, the domesticated Rome treaty rules were not the first to define war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide as crimes under Philippine law. As early as 1935, the Constitution of the Philippine Commonwealth adopted, and I quote, the generally accepted principles of international law as part of the law of the nation, end of quote. Thus, even in the 1930s, customary international law defining war crimes and crimes against humanity had already been domesticated and made part of Philippine law by way of incorporation. In 1949, the Philippine Supreme Court affirmed that customary international law prohibiting the crime of aggression, war crimes, and crimes against humanity were already part of Philippine law and could be the basis for a criminal prosecution before a Philippine court. This was the case of Lieutenant General Kuroda, commanding general of the Japan. Domesticated Rome treaty rules were not the first to provide for the punishment of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide as crimes under international law. In 2009, the Philippine Congress enacted Republic Act No. 9851, otherwise known as the Philippine Act on Crimes Against International Humanitarian Law, Genocide, and Other Crimes Against Humanity. The statute declared the policy of the Philippine state to, and I quote, exercise its criminal jurisdiction over those responsible for international crimes, end of quote. The Philippine statute imposed penalties of imprisonment for up to reclusion perpetua, a fine in an amount up to 1 million pesos, and for feature of the proceeds of the crimes. The statute also gave regional trial courts subject matter jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide, as these are defined in the Philippine statute. Two years after the enactment of RA 9851 in 2011, the Philippine president signed the instrument of ratification of the Rome Statute. The president then transmitted the same to the Philippine Senate for concurrence as required under Section 21, Article 7 of the Constitution. At least two-thirds of all the members of the Senate adopted a Senate resolution concurring in the president's ratification. After compliance with the requirement under Philippine law, the executive department deposited the instrument of ratification with the UN Secretary General in compliance with the requirement of the Rome Statute. In November 2011, the Rome Statute entered into force for the Philippines, and the Philippines became a party to the treaty. Less than seven years later, 
on March 15, 2018, the Philippine president announced that the Republic of the Philippines would withdraw as a party to the Rome Statute. Under Article 127 of the treaty, a state may withdraw from the treaty or the Philippine diplomatic representative delivered the written notification of withdrawal to the UN Secretary General's representative. On March 17, the UN Secretary General received the withdrawal notice. Under Article 127 of the treaty, the withdrawal was to take effect, and I quote, one year after the date of receipt of the notification, end of quote. On May 16, 2018, two months after delivery of the withdrawal notice in New York, six senators filed the first petition entitled Cayetano versus, sorry, Pangilinan versus Cayetano. The petition sought to invalidate the executive department's action of delivering the withdrawal notice. Less than a month later, on June 7, the Philippine Coalition for the International Criminal Court and certain individuals filed the second petition, praying for the same thing. Two months later, on August 14, 14 the Integrated Bar of the Philippines filed the third petition. The three cases were consolidated and oral arguments were held from August to October 2018. On March 17, 20 is to be a party to the Rome Statute. On March 16 of this year, one year uh, the Philippine Supreme Court issued a press release stating that the court had dismissed the three petitions for being moot and academic. Four months later, on July 21, the Supreme Court released a copy of the decision that we are now examining. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Palacios. That is a good starting point. Fina? Yeah, I'm trying to open my video. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Palacios. That is a good starting point in unpacking the many aspects of the decision. One important dimension of the ruling is its impact and implication on constitutional law. What are the implications of this decision in public law? Our next speaker will present a critique of Pangilinan, Pangilinan versus Cayetano to show why these spaces for dismissing the case are flawed and why this decision may have a very little impact on constitutional law. Our next speaker, Professor Dante Gatmaitan, is a scholar and a professor of constitutional law, legal method, and local government law. His research interests include constitutional amendments, the interaction of law and politics, and comparative constitutionalism. As a scholar, Professor Gatmaitan has published his work on a wide range of issues, including books and articles on the environment, gender, the judiciary, and the intersection of law and politics. He has authored books in constitutional law, local government law, legal method, local environment local environmental governance, among others. Other books Professor Gatmaitan has authored include Legal Method Essentials, Local Government Law and Jurisprudence, and Constitutional Law in the Philippines, Government Structure. Furthermore, Professor Gatmaitan's numerous articles have also been published by both local and international journals. A collection of his scholarly work can be found in the book more equal than others, constitutional law and politics and underclass, public interest law practice perspectives. Professor Gatmaitan graduated from the UP College of Law in 1991. In 1995, he earned a Master of Studies in Environmental Law from Vermont Law School. He graduated as cum laude. In 1996, he earned his Master of Laws at the University of California Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Professor Dante Gatmaitan. Good morning. Um, good morning to our guests, uh, the Dean and the faculty of the UP College of Law, our students um, and guests. Thank you to uh, the Justice George Malcolm Foundation for uh, organizing this event and to the Institute of International Legal Studies uh, for making sure it happens. Today I'm going to talk about 
an aspect of the Pangilinan versus Cayetano case and this would be the grounds for the dismissal um, of the case and here I'm arguing that these grounds are, are both old and new um, that's why I call them variant uh, technicalities I think the court fashioned um, new technicalities uh, so that it will have a reason to dismiss the case. Now, I will talk about the two grounds um, which were cited by the Supreme Court. One is the standing of the petitioners, the Supreme Court saying that they did not have standing, and mootness. Um, and of course, in both cases, I argue and I show how the court might have gotten it wrong. These are my takeaways from the case. I have two main ones. Okay, the first one is that this is a win for President uh, Duterte. What he wanted was a way out of the Rome Statute, and that's exactly what he got. Okay, now the media, when the decision came out, uh, kept focusing its attention on those passages from the decision that suggested that the, the Philippines was still bound to cooperate with the ICC despite the withdrawal from the Rome Statute. Okay, And it's a win for the Duterte because that's not even a ruling of the Supreme Court. That is found in the Rome Statute itself, as I'll show you in Article 127 on withdrawal from the statute. And here the Supreme Court um, simply reiterates what the statute says and that is that a state shall not be discharged uh, from its obligations uh, while it was a party to the statute and uh, the withdrawal shall not affect any cooperation with the court so it's not that the supreme court continued to mandate cooperation from the national government. It's already stated in the own statute, so it's nothing new. The second takeaway that I have is this may not be valuable as a constitutional law case or a public international law case because the case was dismissed on technicalities. So it's a great case for legal method um, uh, because we get the chance to analyze the rule on standing for legislators, we also have a chance to analyze mootness and whether it was properly applied by the Supreme Court in this case. So let's look at the first ground for the dismissal of the case and that has to do with standing. And before Pangilinan, the rule on standing for legislators was very, very clear. A legislator had standing to challenge uh, you know, an act of the executive which amounted to a usurpation of legislative powers. Okay, uh, And in another case, the Supreme Court said a member of the House of Representatives has standing to maintain and violate the prerogatives, powers, and privileges vested by the Constitution in his office. So if a legislator felt that his or her prerogatives were being usurped by another branch of government, that confers standing on that legislator. In a more recent case, the Supreme Court reiterates this rule. It's an old one. Yeah. And it says that the legislators will have legal standing to see to it that the prerogative powers and privileges vested by the Constitution in their office remain inviolate. So they are allowed to question official actions which in their minds infringes on their prerogatives as legislators, which I think applies clearly to this case because the petitioners were arguing that a unilateral withdrawal from their own statute cannot be constitutionally done because a uh, concurrence um, of the Senate is required.
However, this is the, the ruling that we get from the Supreme Court. And this is why I call it the variant. Because, and these are, this is a quote from the decision itself, the Supreme Court said that they didn't, the Senate didn't enforce a, a Senate resolution um, that expressed its position on the issue. And for the first time, I think, uh, the Supreme Court has ruled that an action by the Senate was necessary before coming to this court, which I think is unusual because it has always been um, an individual senator who can do this. And now the Supreme Court has tied standing to a an institutional position to be made by a chamber of Congress. Again, Quoting from the court, um, it says, the court says that the Senate did not uh, pass that resolution expressing its position. That concurrence is required before a withdrawal from the room statute can be validly made for petitioners to bring this case to court. But the fact that the Senate did not act on um, that resolution, according to the court, forecloses the institutions uh, or the senators' uh, chances of bringing this case to court. And that bothers me a lot because that's not what I learned uh, in law school. What's wrong with what the court just said? The institutional position of the Senate does not confer standing. It doesn't. As I explained earlier, it is when any senator feels that their prerogatives are being usurped by another branch of government that gives them standing. When they're trying to protect their office, that gives them standing. It's not the, the, the Senate as an institution. So whether the Senate as an institution has a position on the issue or not, then it shouldn't really matter. Next. The Supreme Court seems to be telling us that the constitutionality of the act of the president is determined by the Senate by refusing to act on the resolution. By refusing to pass it, then apparently the Senate has no problem with it and therefore it's constitutional. That's also wrong. And this approach by the Supreme Court actually gives um, legislators or let's say uh, a chamber of Congress dominated by the president's allies to prevent dissent by proposing institutional positions on an issue and then refusing to act on it. It therefore prevents anyone from going to court to challenge the act of the president because as an institution they will say well the Senate doesn't see, see anything wrong with it or the House of Representatives doesn't see anything wrong with it, therefore, we're not going to go to court. And according to the Supreme Court, therefore, you don't have standing. I think that's just messed up. Now, every first year student knows that there is a nuclear option available to constitutional litigators. And that is the transcendental importance um, <clears throat> uh, argument. But again, this is what the Supreme Court says here, that the petitioners did raise transcendental importance. But um, the case does not involve funds or assets. Neither was there any express disregard of a constitutional or statutory prohibition. And uh, petitioners fail to show that no other party has a more direct personal and material interest. That's amazing because I think every word in that sentence is wrong, with all due respect. The court adds that the alleged transcendental importance of the issues will be better served when there are actual cases with proper parties suffering an, an, an imminent injury. For the court to hear the case, according to Pangilina and versus Cayetano, there has to be a proper party. And that just makes things worse. 
I'm offended by the the decision. First of all, this is not a taxpayer suit. In which case, there's no reason for anyone to invoke the illegal disbursement of public funds because that is necessary when you're arguing for standing as a taxpayer. But that's not what you're doing when you're um, arguing transcendental importance. When you're doing that, you're admitting you don't really have standing, but the issues are so important that you're asking the court to hear the case anyway. When you argue there is an illegal disbursement of public funds, what you're actually saying is, I am standing as a taxpayer. And then the court says that uh, there's um, no actual injury, or uh, there's no, there's no uh, violation of any constitutional prohibition. I, I think, I think there is because the the senators are arguing that their concurrence are is needed before a withdrawal from the Rome Statute can be validly done. So there is a constitutional prohibition, and the court. Uh, is looking for actual imminent injury, which is not necessary in a case where you're invoking transcendental importance. The beauty of that argument is that you're asking the court to set aside a technicality, which is standing in this jurisdiction because of the importance of the issues. And there is um, an array, an avalanche, if you will, of cases saying exactly that that because of the importance of the issue we are relaxing the rules on standing you don't have to have standing it's just a technicality anyway let's 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 deal with this issue because it requires resolution from the court and just to be clear this is the point that I'm trying to make. Transcendental importance dispenses with the standing requirement. So you don't you don't decide in this transcendental importance by looking for standing. Then show you don't say, okay, it's important, but show me someone who has a direct interest in this case, someone who is directly injured. The Supreme Court is contradicting itself. Let us go to um, the second ground for the dismissal of the case, and that is mootness. And here, what the Supreme Court said was that all the acts that are necessary for the withdrawal from the Rome Statute have been consummated, and therefore there is nothing left to do because the Philippines has withdrawn. Uh, from the Rome Statute. And, and to me that's a problem because I think um, the acceptance of the ICC of the, the withdrawal cannot be considered a supervening event that renders a case moot. It's not because there's an argument that it was unconstitutionally done. So if the withdrawal was unconstitutional, then nothing could have been validly transmitted to the ICC and the ICC could not have validly accepted anything and the withdrawal was not validly done. So therefore, the case is not moot. And I liken this, this case, uh, you know, to, to those cases that we have where an unqualified uh, aspirant to public office is elected. Say if you were uh, a fugitive from justice, you are disqualified, and then because of your charm and charisma and political machinery, you win. The Supreme Court doesn't say, well, the people have spoken and there's nothing else for us to do. The Supreme Court will say, as it has, that it doesn't matter how many votes you got, if you're disqualified, you're disqualified and you were never validly elected. So there, even if the people spoke, you know, the voters uh, spoke, it doesn't resolve the issue. If you're disqualified, you cannot have, you could not have been validly elected into office. Okay? So in the same way, an unconstitutional act on the part of the president could not have uh, rendered the case moot. 
And even if the case was moot, every first year law student knows that there are exceptions to the mootness doctrine. And the Supreme Court typically gives us four exceptions. And uh, here it's listed in David versus Mukabagal Arroyo. Now, and if we look through them, I, I think um, the, we satisfy the exceptions. First of all, there's a grave violation of the Constitution. And that's what the senators were saying. You violated the Constitution because you require concurrence from two thirds of the Senate. Let's skip to the second one because I'll discuss it in, uh, later. And then the court says there's an exception when constitutional issues raise requires formulation of controlling principles, which I think happened here. Because despite dismissing the case, the court went on for future guidance of litigants to lay down rules on withdrawals from uh, uh, treaties and other international agreements. That's the because we've entered into a whole lot of treaties. So it can happen again. So on those three grounds, it's clear that even if the case was moot, the court could have decided the case. And on that second exception, uh, the Supreme Court said you can satisfy the second exception if there is some perceived benefit to the public. And um, in one case, the Supreme Court said there's no hard and fast rule in determining whether a case uh, involves paramount public interest, but uh, there should be some perceivable benefit to the public, which demands the court to proceed with the resolution of a case that is otherwise moot. Some perceivable benefit to the public. And are there perceivable benefits to the public in this case? I would say so. Uh, one is the proper interpretation of the Constitution. I think we all ought to know um, what the rules are when it comes to withdrawing from treaties and other international agreements. That by itself is a benefit uh, that we can all enjoy. And, and, and um, secondly, of course, the, the withdrawal from the, from the Rome Statute affects the uh, the remedies available to the thousands of victims of extrajudicial killings that have um, that erupted really uh, during the Duterte regime. So on those two notes, um, it's also clear that we satisfy the second ground for exception under the mootness doctrine. So one, it's not moot, two, even if it was, we satisfy all the requirements for the exceptions and therefore the court could have, if it really wanted to, decided on this case. Couple of notes. Um, I think Bangalinen versus Cayetano uh, cluttered the constitutional litigation with, uh, you know, variant technicalities. New things to think about um uh, when you're litigating although my position is that um, these are these are just simply wrong uh but the supreme court has spoken so that's that's the rule you have to i have to revise my book on legal method again and um, this victory gives uh, president duterte uh, his latest win in this spotless record before the Supreme Court. Probably the only president we've ever had who's never lost. In the post Marcos uh, era, anyway. So, there, I would like to thank you and I look forward to a fruitful discussion um, at the proper time. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Gatmaitan. That was such a rich presentation that I can already see questions percolating in your minds. Questions that you can ask by using the Q&A function of the webinar. Uh, so you can do that now, or you can ask in the live uh, question and answer later. So we look forward to those questions later. Now we turn to the international dimension of the Pangilinan ruling. 
Our esteemed third speaker on this topic is Professor Dr. Diane Descherto. Dr. Descherto is a professor of law and global affairs at the University of Notre Dame. She is also the faculty director of the university's LLM program in human rights with joint appointment at the Keough School of Global Affairs. She is also a faculty fellow at the Klaus Center for Civil Human Rights, the Kellogg Institute of International Studies, the Liu Institute for Asia and Asian Studies, uh, Pult Institute for Global Development, and the Novich Institute of European Studies. She is also a co-principal investigator of the Notre Dame Reparations Design and Compliance Lab. Dr. Ducerto previously also taught at the University of the Philippines, Peking University School of Trends. Dr. Ducerto also serves on the editorial and scientific advisory boards of the European Journal of International Law and the editor of its leading international law blog, Ijo Talk. Journal of World Investment and Trade, International Law Studies, and various Asian international law journals. Dr. Desherko's fields of expertise are international law and human rights, international economic law and development, international arbitration, maritime security, ASEAN law, and comparative public law. Her rich legal scholarship includes having authored or edited books which include public policy in international economic law, the ICSCR in Trade, Investment, and finan Finance, ASEAN Law and Regional Integration, Governance, and the Rule of Law in Southeast Asia's Single Market. Dr. Desherto holds JSD and LLM degrees from Yale Law School. Dr. Desherto, during her time at Yale, was also Howard M. Holtzman Fellow in International Arbitration and Dispute Resolution, a Lillian Goldman Perpetual Scholar, editor of the Yale Journal of International Law, and a 2010 to 2011 Yale Fellow of His Excellency Judge Bruno Sima and Judge Bernardo Sepulveda Amor at the International Court of Justice, The Hague, the Netherlands. She graduated from the UP College of Law as class salutatorian and cum laude in 2004. She was chair of the editorial board of the Philippine Law Journal, and she also graduated as summa cum laude and class valedictorian of the UP School of Economics in 2000. And this and her participation in our lecture today is particularly apropos because she is also the Philippines focal point person appointed by the International Criminal Court Bar Association. Dr. Diane Desherto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Tiu, and thank you very much to the University of the Philippines College of Law, to esteemed colleagues and mentors and contemporaries and former students. It is always a pleasure to be able to return home, however virtually, and most importantly on a discussion such as this facilitated by the Malcolm Foundation. It's quite apropos to have the discussion every time, and I get intrigued every time the Philippine Supreme Court weighs in on international legal issues and puts forward another species of decision-making involving the interrelationship between constitutional law and international law. Now, my predecessors, Professor Palacios and Professor Gatmaitan, have very ably discussed the background of the case, the context of the case, the constitutional critique of the case. My task here to focus on the international law dimensions will necessarily engage a close read of the case itself. It's actually well worth the read to find out what it is exactly that the court decided, what it is that the court averred as part of its opinion, and what really, what kind of impact, if anything, would it have on the international proceedings? So if you permit me to share my screen, I promise to be as brief as I can and go through these slides quickly. Um, let's start the slideshow. So I've aimed to discuss three points, uh, with part of which has already overlapped with what Professor Gatmaitan has already discussed on the decision on mootness and the dispositive in particular, the dispositive portion of the Supreme Court decision. I will then proceed to discuss the status of Pangilinan as a judicial decision and what its legal consequences are, if any, on the pending Article 15 request of the International Criminal Court prosecutor for judicial authorization to initiate an investigation into the crime against humanity of murder um, committed between July 1, 2016 and March 16, 2019. 
Some of the references I'll point to are already, um, particularly my analysis of treaties in the Philippine constitutional system are already out with the Vienna Journal of International Constitutional Law. My short observation to this, because I'm sure as Justice Carpio very richly discussed in his remarks, there is a consider considerable conundrum about what we do with treaties as a species of law. And the interesting thing in this article that I've pointed out is that the Philippine Supreme Court has never had a clear methodology for how it treats the legal categorization of treaties, how they are recognized, how they are transformed, and how they're incorporated. We have a category of what is called formal treaties that are subject to advice and concurrence by the Senate under Section 7, Article 7, Section 21 of the 1987 Constitution, but there's also a species of agreements called executive agreements for which the Philippine Supreme Court, dating back to its practices since the early 1930s, has recognized agreements that do not require any discernible process for their passage or for their termination. And then the third avenue is what Professor Palacios discussed earlier, which is the notion of incorporation under Article 2, Section 2 of the 1987 Constitution. When the Constitution says the generally accepted principles of international law are part of the law of the land, what does that mean? Some Supreme Court decisions have used that same phrase as the basis to treat treaties or international agreements that do not have the same formal qualities as possessing Senate advice and concurrence as somehow incorporated into Philippine jurisdiction by virtue of the incorporation clause in the Constitution. And what's interesting about, at least in my end, from with respect to the Pangilinan decision, is that it attempts somehow to try and lay down rules in this regard without, unfortunately, paying heed to the track record of jurisprudence that the Philippine Supreme Court has established when it comes to treating um, the passage of treaties and the formalities required and the kind of legal recognition that ensues from the passage of these treaties. So let me start with the dispositive. As we said, um, I'd like to take a close textual look whenever it's a hundred page something decision because it says something about the, the manner and style in which the decision was reached and in particular what it is that the court said. I broke this down simply because I was intrigued as to how the court, the unanimous court in this case, on a basis of reasoning on mootness somehow manages to come up with a hundred page decision on this matter. You will find that in parts seven and eight of the decision, there's a long disquisition on foreign sources, as well as new guidelines that the court claims is the modality for evaluating cases concerning the president's withdrawal from international agreements. And to this end, this is exactly what Justice Carpio was describing earlier, the notion of incorporating a mirror principle that was articulated by Yale Law School Dean Harold Cole in one of his legal articles and was grafted wholesale into this decision. There's also an incorporation of the Youngstown versus Sawyer case on executive action and Medellin versus Texas on the president's foreign affairs powers. Now at the outset, I always find it interesting whenever a comparative resort to United States jurisprudence is done by the Philippine Supreme Court, because this, the court is never quite clear as to what, as to the criteria by which they deem these foreign sources relevant. And one of the things that I will suggest later on in this presentation is perhaps in looking so much towards the frameworks established under the United States presidency, the Philippine Supreme Court overlooked that there are other sources of checks and balances within the United States constitutional system, such as federalism, which doesn't exist in the Philippine constitutional setting, which is probably why we shouldn't be so hastily ready to accept um, precedents or persuasive or otherwise from the United States but I'll get there at a certain point in time. What's relevant is part nine, where the court declares the petitions are moot 
And then the summary in the last two pages of the decision, where the court reiterates that it again dismissed the petitions for failing to demonstrate dis justiciability, failing standing, and that the petitions are moot. The court again reiterated its guidelines for how executive action is to be evaluated when it comes to the narrow case of withdrawing international agreements. So let me move to the next slide. As I said, this was the disposition. It's one line. It simply says the cases are dismissed for being moot. It doesn't even say that the cases are dismissed for a lack of justiciability, for a lack of standing. The only reason put forward in the dispositif of this case is mootness, and which was already amply discussed by Professor Gatmaitan. Let's remember what was the relief that was sought from the court under the petitions for certiorari and mandamus. There was on the uh, uh, an application for a writ of certiorari to declare the withdrawal from the Rome statute invalid or ineffective, and second, in order to compel the executive branch to notify the UN Secretary General that it is canceling, revoking, and withdrawing the instrument of withdrawal. This is important because it a later point within the Pangilinan decision, the court claims that the decision or the action of the president to withdraw from the Rome statute is, quote, irreversible, that there is no process by which the president's withdrawal could be retracted within the one year period set under Article 127, Paragraph 1 of the Rome statute. But What's interesting is that even in that respect, the court did not take into account the very same practice of the court that they were trying to imp implement. In 2017, there was an attempt, or at least there was a notice of rescission that was filed by the Gambia with respect to within the one year period in, under Article 127, they filed a notice of rescission that was accepted by the UN Secretary General that ensured that the Gambia would stay within the Rome Statute. So for the court to say that it was irreversible, what the president did was already foreclosed and it was completed, was in itself uh, a narrow understanding of what the practices were at the International Criminal Court. And I'll skip the expanded power of judicial review. As we all know, the judicial review powers of the Supreme Court, and this probably I, the only reason why I'm, I'm including this here, is because the nature of our judicial review under the Philippine Constitution is vastly greater than the nature of judicial review under the United States Constitution. So to the extent that so much deference was lent by the Philippine Supreme Court to foreign precedents, particularly precedents under the US jurisdiction, there was in a certain sense, a relegation of the expanded power of judicial review and how important that is for the unique constitutional system of the Philippines. So again, what were the issues raised? These, I'll, let me go through this very quickly because this has already been discussed by the three previous speakers, three sets of petitioners. All of the petitions were filed after March 17, 2018, which is the date of effectivity of the withdrawal of the notice of withdrawal and deposit by the Philippine government with the UN Secretary General, all of whom were alleging different grounds. One set of petitioners, the second set of petitioners, the Philippine Coalition for the ICC, were alleging violations of their constitutional rights and also in particularly were alleging and alleging that the rome statute still existed even without publication because of the incorporation clause this goes into what i was describing earlier that some of the jurisprudence of the supreme court has accepted treaties and softer instruments as having been already admitted into the philippines by virtue of the incorporation clause and the third petitioner the integrated bar of the philippines Again, what was the reason for declaring all the petitions moot? You can find it in the fourth paragraph of the decision, where in the simple narrative, the court simply says that because on March 17, 2018, in sum, because withdrawal was perfected, 
The Philippines completed all the requisite acts of withdrawal, and this was all consistent and in compliance with what the Rome Statute plainly requires. Everything to enable withdrawal had already been consummated. The petitions were therefore moot when they were filed. This raises an important question, because if this is really a question of time as to whether or not there was a perfected act of withdrawal and whether that correlated with the specific items of relief that the petitioners were seeking, one has to question how the Supreme Court ended up with a hundred page decision interpreting constitutional law and the Rome Statute if supposedly the petitions were at the outset already moot. If the case is moot and dismissed for mootness, what is the status of all other rules and guidelines that were placed by the Supreme Court in this decision in regard to the interpretation of constitutional provisions on treaties and the incorporation clause. This, and one has to wonder, and we have to separate this a little bit because there seems to be, at least from the conception of the court in this decision, a hard notion that what was at stake was simply the written notice of withdrawal and whether that was perfected. But if we go back to what the parties were asking, part of what they were asking for in the petition was to ask for the revocation of that notice of withdrawal. It didn't just amount to whether or not the withdrawal was already final. As I said in the example of the Gambia, whose notice of rescission of its notice of withdrawal was accepted by the United Nations Secretary General and also accepted by the Assembly of States parties, one has to question why, insofar as the Supreme Court was concerned, the case was over the moment the Rome Statute, um, rather the moment the notice of withdrawal was filed or deposited or received by March 17, 2018. This is a question because in the one hand, withdrawal from the narrow sense of how the court understands it is limited to the very act of notification of withdrawal, but it doesn't take into account Article 127, where there is an interregnum of one year from the time of the deposit of the notice of withdrawal to the time that all the legal consequences of withdrawal set in. And within that period, certainly to say that the petitioners did not have any interests was quite interesting on the part of the court. This is precisely why the ICC prosecutor's June 2021 statement referred to the withdrawal on March 17 as having absolutely no bearing on the court's jurisdiction over crimes that are alleged to have occurred on the territory of the state during the period when it was a state party to the Rome Statute. The crimes are not subject to any statute of limitation and for the reason for the precise reason that the prosecutor already made a determination when it filed its request to the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court for authorization to proceed with, a, with an investigation. The period covered is July 1, 2016 to March 16, 2019. Insofar as the ICC prosecutor is concerned, nothing that transpired within the Philippine Supreme Court case materially affected the jurisdiction of the prosecutor except for the temporal element, the cutoff time under which the, the crimes alleged would be investigated. The cutoff was 16 March 2019, which is the date, um, the day before the full effectiveness of withdrawal sets in. And again, these were the provisions that were set and discussed by my two previous colleagues, so I'm not going to dwell on that any further. So the question is, were the petitions really moot? And Professor Gatmaitan put forward an excellent discussion of the exceptions to mootness. But one has to understand what is mootness and how did the court understand it? From the international law standpoint, if you're going to think about mootness, there were many things pending insofar as the completion of the notice and deposit of withdrawal, it was completed, but there, the full legal consequences, the effectiveness of withdrawal did not set in until one year after the date of the receipt of notification, one year after March 17, 2018, which is March 17, 
2019. All of the Supreme Court petitions were filed within this one year period. And yet the court says that because withdrawal was perfected, because the withdrawal was irreversible, because there was supposedly no process by which the Rome statute or the International Criminal Court could somehow accept a retraction of the president's withdrawal, then this is already a fait accompli. Then these petitions are already moot. As I said, that required further investigation had they actually taken a look at the pendency of Gamb the Gambia's notice of rescission and the outcome where the ICC accepted the notice of rescission, then perhaps this, the interpretation could have been different in this case. The judicial reasoning is also important because here, by, by presenting, by focusing on mootness from the standpoint of justiciable controversies by virtue of supervening events, again, it makes it so much easier for the court to say everything was done by March 17, 2018. But this depends on what controversy you're defining. And this is why I like to go back to what the petitioners were actually asking. They were in their petitions also asking for the revocation, the rescission of the withdrawal that was sent to the ICC. And so for the court to say with no reference to any international law sources that the, that the retraction, that there was no way to retract the withdrawal was wrong under international law. Here in this part of the decision in page 63 is where the court finds that the president's withdrawal is irreversible and, uh, and thus outside of its judicial power. And here the court expresses apprehensions about interfering with the International Criminal Court, which I thought fairly strange because a notice of rescission had no bearing whatsoever insofar as interfering with the International Criminal Court. This is the text where it says, the text provides a mechanism on how to withdraw from it, but the Rome Statute does not have any proviso on the reversal of a state party's withdrawal. Unfortunately, because the court only focused on the Rome Statute and did not look at the actual practices of the court, the rules of procedure in relation to the court, as well as the, the decisions of the Assembly of State Parties, they failed to take into account that it is possible to have a notice of rescission within the one year interregnum, the one year period before the full effectiveness of withdrawal could take place. The court, as I say, as I said earlier, in pages 64 to 65, again, says the petitions are only directed really uh, insofar as the approval or finality of the withdrawal. They separated the one year period and said in this instance, that there is no bearing and therefore in this case everything was moot and as such there could not have been any legal interest on the part of the petitioners to seek judicial review under the expanded judicial review powers of the Philippine Supreme Court. Again, the court refuses to exercise jurisdiction denying transcendental importance as admirably discussed by Professor Gatmaitan. And this part on page 78 is something I found extremely interesting. The court actually makes a finding of fact and law by saying in these three sentences that the president's withdrawal from the Rome Statute was in accordance with the mechanism provided in the treaty, stating that the Rome Statute itself contemplated and enabled the state party's withdrawal and the state party and its agents cannot be faulted for merely acting within what the Rome Statute expressly allows. What the court was actually doing was interpreting the Rome Statute, which is ironic because this is a decision that says it's moot at the outset from the time of filing. If it is moot at the outset from the time of filing, what business was it of the Philippine Supreme Court at that point in time to say that it would make findings of fact supposedly of the president's compliance with the Rome Statute and with what the Rome Statute supposedly allowed. That kind of determination inserted into the case was quite intriguing because it made no reference to the record whatsoever. It made no reference to the existing procedures of the statute. And frankly, um, it was 
uh, from the standpoint of mootness, it was not necessary to come out with this, this uh, with this finding of fact and law. Again, what was also interesting was page 79, where the court says, what really are the facts that we would take into consideration to establish grave abuse of discretion? And this I found extremely interesting, even in the long jurisprudence of grave abuse of discretion, because in this narrow situation of withdrawal the, by a president from the International Criminal Court, from the Rome Statute, there were specific criteria or factual indicia that the court laid out, again, without citing to any sources. This is basically the court saying, here are the facts that we would have taken into account to say that there was grave abuse of discretion. If somehow there was manifest disregard of previously declared periods for rectification, terms, guidelines, injunctions, if the action was born out of vindictiveness as retaliation or out of personal motives to please personal tastes or to placate personal perceived injuries as to amount to whimsical and arbitrary exercise of discretion. Quite intriguing here is that the court actually set factual criteria, but did not invite the considered that this could be a case of grave abuse of discretion. Again, it's a foreshadowing of what I found so disingenuous to a certain extent with the decision, because on the one hand, it says it's moot, but on the other, it's telling the public this is what it's going to take to be able to revoke presidential withdrawal. So turning, given that kind of paradox in the writing and structure of this decision, the text and structure of this decision, what is the status of Pangilinan as a judicial decision? We all know as lawyers that judicial decisions do form part of the legal system of the Philippines. That's language that is deliberate. It is not the equivalent of forming part of the law of the land. The language is grafted quite similarly to the Napoleonic Civil Code. And as interpreted by the unanimous Supreme Court on Bank decision in 2017, while decisions of the court are not laws pursuant to the doctrine of separation of powers, they evidence their meaning, their breadth, their scope, and therefore they will have the same binding force as the laws themselves. But remember that this case turned on one ground, dismissed for being moot. And thus what is relevant here for purposes of our analysis and for purposes of determining what is binding from this judicial decision is to separate out what is the reasoning for mootness. The reasoning was simply they were moot when they were filed because everything was supposedly perfected by virtue of the withdrawal. And in this way, if we read it in that way, the, the decision actually has less of a presidential, less if not very little narrow um, presidential effect than we would think. I mean, some of the things that troubled Justice Carpio in the beginning, which he aptly pointed out are obiter dicta, could very readily be pointed out as obiter dicta. Because in our jurisdiction, what matters is the principle that underlies the decision in one case. That is what we deem to be controlling as imperative authority. This is why the Philippine Supreme Court made it very clear in 2010 that ours is not a common law system. The judicial precedents are not always strictly and rigidly followed. This is very different from say American common law or English common law, where the entire reason is aptly pointed out by the Supreme Court, the judicial pronouncement in a decision may be followed as a precedent only when its reasoning and justification are relevant. And because Pangilinan was decided on mootness and the only reasoning for mootness was that the petitions were filed after March 17, 2018, everything else that the court said in regard to prescribing guidelines for when a president's act of withdrawal could be controlled somehow under a mirror principle or under the Youngstown framework, all of these findings in and of themselves do not have the precedential value that we would think. So to wrap up, what legal consequences, if any, could there be on the prosecutor's Article 15 request? 
My short answer is there is no legal effect on the ICC prosecutor's pending request at the International Criminal Court. The statute is clear. The request for authorization is submitted to the pretrial chamber along with all the supporting material collected. Victims may make their representations accordingly. The pretrial chamber then has to make a decision examining the request and the supporting material and can authorize the commencement of the investigation without prejudice to subsequent determinations by the court. If the pretrial chamber were to refuse to authorize the investigation, that is not the, that does not close the matter because it will not preclude the current prosecutor, Karim Khan, from presenting or some new facts or evidence regarding the same situation. So in conclusion, what I would say is Pangilinan is a judicial decision of limited effect and will not affect the under Philippine law and will not affect pending ICC proceedings. The 100 page text really leads only to a decision to dismiss all petitions due to mootness. The only relevant reasoning in that decision for purposes of stare decisis under Article 8 of the Civil Code is the judicial reasoning that led to the conclusion of mootness. All else, which is obiter dicta in the decision, will not have the effect of precedent. The decision also has no effect whatsoever on the pending ICC prosecutor's Article 15 request, and that will continue. I very much appreciate the, the opportunity to have this discussion and engage with colleagues, and I look forward to the discussion. All right. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Dicerto. Excellent uh, presentation as always. And uh, all the materials from our speakers today should give us a uh, rich starting point from where we can ask uh, our questions. Uh, and so at this point, we do want to hear from you uh, and see uh, what questions you have for our speakers. Uh, and uh, I will call on Pao, uh, to whom the question is directed. Thank you. Very much. Uh, I have actually one question each for uh, Professor Gatmaitan and Professor Desierto. So for Professor Gatmaitan, I don't know if Sir Dan Gat will agree that the issue on standing that was raised in the case uh, may actually be more of a rightness thing because the court essentially says that the Senate has not yet acted on the proposed resolution. Uh, and on that premise, you know, would he agree that whether the case would, that, would he agree that the decision effectively forecloses any challenge to a unilateral withdrawal from a treaty? Since in a unilateral withdrawal, the president precisely does not submit anything to the Senate, and so the Senate would not have anything to act upon. All right, uh, thank you, Pablo. Be, uh, pardon me before our speakers answer. May I request that uh, the speakers be put on spotlight? Uh, Justice Carpio, uh, Professors Raj Palacios, uh, Dr. Dian Desierto, and Professor Gatmaitan, please. And, okay, so, and then Professor Raj Palacios. So the question was posed to Professors Gatmaitan and Desierto. So, sorry, like for, for Professor Desierto, it's a different question, but maybe best to hear first from Sir Dan. All right. All right, so the, is, the question is whether it's uh, an issue of rightness. Um, I think not, simply because uh, the court doesn't make a reference to, uh, to that technicality. Right? Um, what what I, I read in the uh, opinion of the court was that um, because of the inaction of the Senate, they have no right to bring the case. And that is the, is, is the, the, the part that really jarred me when I was reading this. Because, you know, and for, you know, for all the reasons that I said before, if it was an issue of rightness, they would have said so. So that, that, that's, that's my take on it. Thanks. Thank you, sir. For Professor Desierto, would, would you think that it was proper in the first place for the court um, to even consider the withdrawal mechanism in the ICC statute, which is a matter of international law, considering that the issues raised by the petitioners were constitutional in nature and therefore a matter of municipal law? 
uh, and so could it ever be moot? Could the case ever be moot on the ground of acceptance uh, by, by the ICC? Thanks for the question, Professor Tomase. The interesting point is what the court actually did was to confer judicial notice somehow on practices of the Rome Statute, uh, practices of the court, without really taking judicial notice of the entire practices of the court. And in the process, they engaged in interpretation of the statute without relevance, without actually looking at the actual practice of the court. A notice of rescission of withdrawal is very much possible. It's already been done, but they didn't take judicial notice. So the selectiveness of judicial notice is something I have to wonder about, especially since the decision doesn't refer to anything in the record that the parties adduced, doesn't refer to any other jurisprudence. It's unsourced. So because it's unsourced, I have to wonder where did the court find its interpretation of the Rome Statute? So. To a certain extent, I agree. Um, it wasn't necessary to even go there. If they're going to say that this entire matter is just decided by whether or not their petitions were filed before March 17, 2018, then this could have been a five-page decision, possibly even two. All right. Thank you. Uh, do, the, uh, do you have... Okay, so uh, let me take this opportunity to ask my own question. And I hope I'm not being impertinent in asking this, but I ask this question of you as uh, scholars of uh, you know, law and politics and judiciaries and Justice Carpio has been a member of the judiciary. So the question is how much of this really is the court thinking that the public is not interested enough in the issue so that it won't generate backlash on the kind of method that it yeah, means. I mean, so we know that uh, because you know, sometimes we refer to U.S. decisions, and they do listen to the public pulse. Here, do you think that the court listened and didn't hear enough, so that there's no worry about a backlash of the kind of method that it used here? Uh, to, to everyone who, or to anyone who wants to answer, maybe we can start with uh, Justice Carpio, if you're allowed to even answer that question, just. I think you're on mute. Sorry, uh, you're asking what is the input of uh, public sentiment on decisions of the Supreme Court. Well, it, uh, the Supreme Court uh, will take notice of public sentiment, but whether they actually uh, follow the public sentiment or not is another thing. Uh, you cannot really quantify it. It will be on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, we are all affected by what's happening outside of the court, but... Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we will decide it based on law. Uh, as much as possible, we'll decide it based on law. Uh, but of course, uh, you can always argue that this is based on law when in fact it's not. And uh, that's the big problem. Thank you. Okay. Uh... If I may just add, I thought one of the curious things in the decision was pointing out that there are enough local remedies under Republic Act 9851 which was passed in 2009. But the court, again, in that instance, only looks to the substantive, the subject matter of what crimes are prosecuted under that act. But they neglect the entirety of the edifice of having an international criminal court, the cooperative mechanism and enforcement mechanisms that are available under the Rome Statute. They think that, or at least in the many by local statute, what about the possibility of victims to access directly the procedures at the International Criminal Court, which provide a network, a global network, that is not like the local reach of Republic Act 9851. Again, that's a, another issue of selectiveness when it came to the court's lens when it, um, with respect to the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court. Thank you. Uh, Professor Gatmeta, your thoughts on backlash, perhaps? Um, because I am a skeptical person, I'm, I imagine the Supreme Court didn't really want to write a, a two-page decision. <laughs> and it's because they are considering the, the, the possible backlash, they went on and on and on to, you know, to, to, to provide some guidance for, the, for future litigation. Although I think everybody here today said this is obiter dictum. And I think that would account for you know, the, 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 the fact that we have an extremely long 
potentially useless decision is really a, a, a guard against the backlash. Can you imagine if the Supreme Court came out with a two-page decision saying, oh, this case is smooth? Nobody's going to like that one. Okay. Thank you, Professor Gatnit. Yeah. Uh, yes, just add, uh, there. You see, the we have three branches of government, and uh, each branch must be uh, vigilant that immediately, by the majority in the Senate, would have immediately passed a resolution that uh, the president's act uh, is against uh, the constitution and brought the case to the Supreme Court. That would have settled it, but they did not. And they only realized their mistake when the president again terminated another treaty, the VFA. That's when they passed the resolution and went to the Supreme Court. You see, there is this tension among the three branches. When I was presidential legal counsel, uh, the senators were telling me, why don't you submit the nomination of uh, the press secretary and the secretary for confirmation by the commission on appointments. We will confirm. There will be no problem. I said, but that's not required under the constitution. These are not department heads. Why would we allow, uh, uh, give you the power to veto appointment of the president when you don't have that power? But the moment you allow that, you know, in the future, the president will be bound by that. So here, the Senate allowed the president to unilaterally terminate a treaty when it should not have allowed it. And it realized its mistake. That's why they passed a resolution that uh, in the next uh, treaties that, the, that they ratified, they put a condition, president can only withdraw upon consent. They also went to the Supreme Court when the president again tried to terminate another treaty. So I would fault the Senate here. The Senate should have stood its ground at the very start because there is always this tension among the branches of government, each one trying to usurp the power of the other. They should have stood their ground immediately, but unfortunately they did not. They, they, uh, they did it uh, the, when the president uh, try to abrogate another treaty unilaterally. So, But just before that, Justice, I'm very sorry. Let me hear if a Professor Raj has thoughts on the question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. The question was on the susceptibility of the court to backlash. Uh, the IBP engages in public interest litigation. We've filed several cases in the Supreme Court. This one, the Supreme Court decides on the basis of law uh, without regard to backlash, whether public or political. All right, thank you, Professor Tina. Yeah, um, before you ask the question, I may I just acknowledge the presence of our former ombudsman, former C C uh, Supreme Court Associate Justice Conchita Carpio Morales. We, she, she wasn't uh, in um, when we uh, called her name earlier, but she's now in. I see her. Good morning, Justice Chip. Good morning, Fina. I'm sorry. He, I'm not that techy. It took a maid uh, to help That's me. That's all right, Paul. <laughs> That's Thank all you. right. We're glad you're here with us, Justice. It adds yes. to the uh, powerhouse of experts that we have this morning. Uh, you were saying the Justice VV was raising his hand, yes, right? Uh, yes. Maybe uh, we can us... ask our uh, esteemed uh, Professor Justice VV. Sir, you were raising your hand, sir. Please feel free to comment. Okay, okay. <clears throat> thank you very much. To me, the question is, uh, was there a decision in this case? Is Pangilinan versus Cayetano a decision? <laughs> to me, it is not a decision. It is an advisory opinion. There was neither a case, according to the Supreme Court, <laughs> nor a controversy. From the start, they said, oh, nangyari na, it's a fait accompli. Wala na tayong magagawa dyan. And yet, somewhere in this decision, they said, what is a moot case? It is like this. All right. So, and what did the Supreme Court say in its advisory opinion? We want to give the guidelines for future action and they are to be found in the last three paragraphs of that 100-page decision. 
if you look at them, that is the advisory opinion, and that is all that it amounts to. Now, let me begin. Mootness. Mootness is a technical term in constitutional law. It means there was a case or a controversy in the beginning, but some supervening event or the case or controversy ceases so that courts will not decide that generally speaking. Of course, there are exceptions to the mootness doctrine. Number two, the court said, not one of the parties had standing to question the validity of the president's withdrawal from the Rome statute. They did not suffer an injury. The court, uh, rather the Senate, which probably could have raised the question, did not raise it, and why should we take it up? And, for example, <coughs> said, the individual senator just a proposal never adopted by any uh, by the by the senate so that we cannot take that as the position of the senate all right so there was no controversy there was no case it arrived in the court still born so what is the court going to do nothing so actually it was just an advisory opinion and that's very important why is it very important it might have some useful uh, purposes but not for this purpose i think attorney uh, professor gatmaitan was the uh, no professor diane desierto uh, mentioned article 8 of the civil code which makes decisions of the supreme court part and parcel of the, the judicial system, of the legal system. Now that cannot be part of the legal system. You cannot invoke it. You cannot bind the Supreme Court to it. You cannot even say, in the case of Pangilinan versus uh, uh, Cayetano, you said this, the court will not be bound by its own decision. It's not a, what they call president. They will not be bound by their decision. Nothing. It was just an expression of opinion, no better than the opinion expressed here in this forum. That's all. That's Thank all its value. And this is important because shortly after the release of this decision, rendered sometime in January or February, but made public only recently, the newspapers came out with the uh, editorial Supreme Court says that the president cannot withdraw statute from statute without the consent of the Senate. Look at that. And yet that was not a ruling. Even the Supreme Court in its advisory opinion did not say that. What it said is there are instances where the president can withdraw but there are many instances where he cannot withdraw without the concurrence of the Senate. So there are many contradictions in its own decisions, rather opinion. So to me, it's just an advisory opinion, and let us take it like that. Thank you, Justice. Future guidance of uh, Benz and Bar, as the Supreme Court always says. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justice Eve. It's nice to hear your comments. Um, and it's not too far from what has been said uh, by our speakers, actually. So at this point, we do want to call I see, on... I see, I'm sorry, I see Professor Agabin raising his hand, uh, sir. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Fina, before Dean Agabin, uh, Justice Raul Pangalangan um, oh, okay. manifested sorry. his intention to, to ask. Uh, so we'll okay. do Justice yes. uh, Judge Pangalangan and then Dean Agabin after. Thank you so much, yeah, uh, Mike. I actually, this is a, this is a comment I have uh, uh, written on it, and it's about to uh, be published. Um, I agree with uh, Justice Mendoza. Uh, in fact, it strikes me. I'm so glad Justice Mendoza noted that the uh, decision was announced uh, first, like in a press conference, 
It was commented already by the papers and it took another three months before it was formalized in a decision. I find actually this practice of the court rather uh, uh, troubling. And this is not the first time that, uh, that it happened. And I think this goes into the point raised by Mike. Uh, it is part of the court's positioning itself in public uh, discourse. The um, decision by press release, which, and, uh, which, uh, uh, pre, uh, which comes some time before the actual release of the fully reasoned uh, decision. I would like to go back to the point on mootness. Well, I'm struck by what the court said. The petitions were moot at the time they were filed. So my question is, if it was too late when it was filed, what would have been on time? In other words, if the president's act of withdrawing from the statute says that at that moment, there's nothing more that the court can do, when could the petitioners have challenged anything before the president's act? It would have been, again, a mere press release or a press statement. So if it is challenged uh, by the senators or by the coalition, the uh, Philippine coalition for the ICC, if they file the challenge right after the press release, what will they challenge before the court? And what will the court do? Declare it as an unconstitutional press release? Uh, for me, by the court's formulation here, either the case was moot, exactly as the court says, or if they, they filed the petitions ahead of the president's uh, statement, it would have been unripe for adjudication. There would have been, in either case, no action that the Supreme Court has the power to review the constitutionality of treaties and international agreements. If at the moment the president withdraws from a treaty, the case is already moot and academic, then the, the, uh, uh, the court will never have any occasion to exercise its constitutional power. And it renders a nugatory that an entire power, an entire safeguard, the separation of powers mentioned by Justice Carpio is, is, is basically erased by this uh, reading of the, of the mootness doctrine. Let me close on that point, Mike, and thank you so much. Thank you, Judge uh, Raul Pangalangan. Uh, we will hear the thoughts of our speakers perhaps later on the comments of Judge Raul. But for now, let's hear the question from Dean Agabi. Dean, you're on mute, Dean. Hi, Dean. Dean Pick. Dean. You are on mute. You're on mute. Please unmute yourself, Dean. Yeah. This is in connection with the comments of uh, Justice Mendoza and uh, Professor uh, Pangalangan. And uh, perhaps this question should also be addressed to Professor Desierto and to Professor uh, got my turn because while I agree that uh, indeed under the case cited by Professor Desierto, which is the De Castro ruling of the Supreme Court, we are a common law country. I mean, we are a civil law country and therefore uh, we adopt the legal method approach of uh, textual uh, interpretation that it is only facts plus conclusion which constitute a precedent. That is the civil law approach to becoming a or considering a precedent. However, uh, the premise of Professor Desierto that we are a civil law country, essentially, may stand some uh, reconsideration because we are not strictly a civil law country. We are, as my book has said, a mestizo system and constitutional law 
as well as international law, are of common law origin. And under the common law formula for this determining whether a decision of the court is uh, presidential or not, also constitute uh, precedents. For instance, uh, in the case of uh, Marbury versus Madison, the case was also moot because the petitioners in Marbury filed a wrong uh, petition and the Supreme Court of the U.S. could have just dismissed the case. But they went on to decide uh, the general principle of uh, judicial review under the concept of separation of powers. So I believe that uh, with respect to interpretations of constitutional provisions, as well as international law and international treaties, the common law approach should be adopted, which is that the formula is that uh, general principles, regardless of the, the decretory portion, have presidential value. As okay, thank you. Uh, Dean Pick, we hear from Professors Gatmetan and Desherto, their comments on the last two comments. I think this one is for Diane. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dean Agavin. It's wonderful to see you. I cite your book, and indeed, we are a mixed jurisdiction in the Philippines. But one of the things that I will take um, a different view on is how the Supreme Court selects foreign sources and determines them to have presidential value. What's ironic here is that while the Supreme Court says that a Yale Law Journal article by Harold Cole and a case Youngstown uh, versus uh, Youngstown versus Sawyer is somehow decisive insofar as important presidential value. And that's the problem. And if we have a theory of precedent that is consistently, at least fairly, agree with you completely, um, Bean. If we had a court that was conscious of the effect of precedent and thus was more careful in how it elucidates and elaborates its reasoning, then perhaps we would not be in a situation where one case there's different appreciation of what is a binding precedent and what is relevant as opposed to other cases. Why is the South African practice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa irrelevant? They said it was because they have a parliamentary system. Why do they assume that the U.S. court decision is always going to be relevant when the checks and balances in the U.S. constitutional framework, as you know, Dean, are not exactly the same thing? We don't have a federal system of government. There are different checks and balances within the U.S. Constitution. But if we're aiming for consistency, I, I very much agree with Justice Vivi that perhaps the way to look at this is to look at everything except two or three pages in this decision as an advisory opinion. Thank you, Dr. Desheta. Sorry, we are monitoring questions. So I was reading some of them. I think, Fina, we have a question from uh, a, the secretary of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, uh, and she wants guidance uh, on what to make of this decision. Perhaps the, uh, the question that she really wants answered is, can the speakers take a position on this concurrent, concurrence issue? I mean, if it were a uh, legal issue, really, what's your, what are your thoughts on whether the Senate should concur? in uh, withdrawals from treaty regimes. Uh, Justice Carpio, perhaps, to start, and then Professor Gatmetan. As I said, this is a battle for turf. If the Senate does not assert its uh, prerogative to concur, it will lose its prerogative to concur. So uh, there is a constant battle among the branches of government. And the moment you concede, your prerogative to another branch that could bind you in the future. So 
I think what the Senate should do is to say that the president can never withdraw unilaterally a treaty without the consent of the Senate. They should be very categorical about that. And uh, to preserve their prerogative in case of future uh, cases filed with the court, the court will take notice of that. That uh, That's the position of the Senate, very categorical. But the moment you waffle, the moment you show any doubt about your prerogative, you will lose it. And this is exactly what happened here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Justice. We will have one round of answers uh, for all the speakers and then one more question that Fina Fina will uh, read to us because that's the only time uh, we have left. Uh, we, we will go to Dr. Dichetto and then Professor Dan after. I will draw a distinction between a situation of joining a treaty as opposed to withdrawing from a treaty, especially a treaty such as the Rome Statute. Because we haven't discussed it fully yet here, but what are the consequences insofar as any third party rights are concerned? The Rome Statute provides access to victims to participate in the procedure, independent of the Philippine government's position, victims have access to the procedures of the Rome Statute. That creates rights, a vested right to a remedy. Before that remedy could be taken, can it just be taken by a president? Does it not, in fact, lend greater urgency to have a co-equal branch of government, the legislature, weigh in and concur before stripping vested rights? I mean, that's something that probably the Pangilinan decision does so much to muddle um, by equating RA 9851 as somehow the equivalent of the Rome Statute, when it is not. Thank you, Dr. Desierto, Professor Dan. I agree with uh, Justice Carpio and Dr. Desierto. And I think there's room for us to make that kind of a ruling, you know, that, 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 that strong ruling, because my, my research assistants and I are examining all the constitutions of the world. And the fact is that most of the constitutions are written the way ours is on this issue. It is open-ended. It doesn't say whether uh, Senate concurrence is required for a withdrawal. So this would have been that opportunity for us, you know, to, to protect the vested rights, as, as Diane was saying, uh, you know, to, to be more categorical in our ruling, as Justice Carpio said. Uh, and I think we, we let that moment slip. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Dan. Professor Raj, your thoughts? Um, I guess I need to reiterate the position of the IDP in the case. Uh, shared powers, uh, there is actually an implied requirement for concurrence. Thank you, uh, Professor Raj. Fina, uh, we're down to our last question. Sorry, you are on mute, Fina. Yes, it's a very proud question from uh, uh, one of our participants. If the Supreme Court's decision in the Pangilinan case is not properly a decision, but simply an advisory opinion, then can a new petition on the same matter be filed again? Who do we ask? <laughs> uh, we can pose the question to all of them as an, to all an of end, the speakers to, to, yes. to end the question portion. Um, we'll start uh, with Professor Raj first, and then we, we end with Justice Carpio. Well, yes, thank you. That is uh, that's a good point, and the hope is that uh, the Supreme Court will take a different approach this time, allowing the parties to proceed and to decide the case on the merits. Uh, Dr. Desierto. I wouldn't say exactly the same petition. Um, one has to be mindful of what the court has said in terms of its lenses of what they think happened here. They think, for example, that the withdrawal is irreversible. You'd have to anchor the case or controversy on something else, something that continues, the deprivation of rights that continues as a result of a withdrawal that neither conformed to constitutional process or was not consistent with the Philippines treaty obligations, or maybe, maybe petitions should start thinking about to what extent is the force to suggest 
I find that interesting because in the 1987 constitution, which has an expanded judicial review clause, the court is saying that they will not exercise jurisdiction relying on United States precedent, which doesn't have the grave abuse of discretion expanded judicial review clause. That probably is a structural or teleological approach to the constitutional interpretation, but the theory has to change. And I'm wary of a Supreme Court that gives complete deference to a president on all matters of foreign affairs and foreign policy. If there's one thing that we've learned here in the United States, giving untrammeled discretion to a president without legislative oversight is a recipe for disaster. Thank you, Dr. Desharto. Professor Gatmetan. Okay, um, I agree. Uh, we can't have the exact same case because they were, you know, the, the ruling was that the withdrawal had been completed. That's the reason why it's moved. However, if I understood the question to mean that what about future cases and other treaties? You know, um, will this case have an impact on other, on other treaties? Uh, there's a chance that the Supreme Court will abandon everything they said in 98 pages and say, well, technically, you know, because nobody liked what we said, that's really just obiter dictum. Right, and then that, that gives them an opportunity to to to, to give another, you know, uh, to make another decision, uh, preferably one that makes us uh, all happy. But I'm not, I'm not they're not we're not really bound by it because it's all better. So a future case can really change the the, the tenor of uh, this discourse. Thank you, Professor Dan Justice Carpio. Uh, Justice, you're on mute. There's actually a pending case, uh, similar case, the VFA. Uh, uh, although the president has uh, withdrawn the cancellation, uh, this could be an opportunity for the Supreme Court to clarify the issues uh, that we have raised here. Uh, of course, the, pre the Supreme Court can always say that uh, it's smooth also, but I think uh, uh, the, the those who want to question the uh, the uh, the Pangilinan decision can uh, intervene in that case, can, or can those who are presently involved in that case can uh, raise can raise new questions, because uh, it could be clarified in this VFA case. But of course, the court can always say that uh, it's smooth also. So we'll have to wait for a new case and. Uh, that I think uh, there will be new cases because uh, this decision uh, uh, could be, or some taxpayers that uh, the uh, tax treaties uh, have not really taken effect because there, there are no mandatory legislation. I mean, there will be many cases involving this. This will, this will uh, uh, spawn uh, future cases involving the same issue, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Carpio. And to all our uh, speakers who answered all the questions, we didn't, weren't able to ask all of them, but we'll send some of them to you if you'd like. Uh, and we're sorry uh, that we have limited time. Maybe we, can, uh, Mike, maybe we can ask our speakers for their final words, if any. Uh, right. Um, so are there any final comments we, that the speakers would like to say? I just would like to take the opportunity to thank the UP College of Law uh, for letting me pop in. Uh, it's 11 o'clock at night over here. I'm having a very deceptive background uh, to pretend that it's the morning, but it's always great to listen to my mentors, my former colleagues, my, the entire ecosystem of the UP College of Law remains as intellectually robust and inspiring as it has. And to Professor Molo, who asked me to give a shout out, I'm giving him a shout out right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Desheto. I'm also giving Professor Molo a shout out because he's also one of the uh, organizers of this uh, Malcolm Lecture. Uh, before I turn it over to Fina to introduce uh, our uh, the Dean, I do want to make a couple of announcements. The first is that there is a link to a, an evaluation so that we can be better the next time. Uh, please uh, click the link and answer the survey so you can also get the certificate of attendance to the webinar. 
And second, we ask our speaker to introduce the closing. Okay, so we now formally close our webinar today. We are really grateful and thankful to our powerhouse of uh, Common 3. Aside from being Dean of the College, Professor Vistan teaches Constitutional Law, Civil Procedures, Special Proceedings, Transportation and Public Utilities, Torts and Damages, Supervised Legal Research, and Law Practicum. In the Master of Laws program, he teaches International Anti-Corruption Compliance. He also concurrently serves as Director of the UP Office of Legal Aid. Dean Vistan holds a Master of Laws degree from Yale Law School and is a candidate for the degree of Doctor of Science of Law in the same university. Aside from his academic engagements with the university, Dean Carlo is also a published author and a litigation and election lawyer. Ladies and gentlemen, let us please welcome our Dean Edgardo Carlo L. Vistan II. Thank you, Pina and Mike. The decision in Pangilinan versus Cayetano reminded me of a very simple but profound statement in the Ponencia of Justice George Malcolm in the 1919 case of Villa Vicencio versus Lukban. And that statement is, and I quote, law defines power. In its simplest sense, this statement tells us how the different power structures in relation the importance of the law in this sense is quite evident. In a rather awkward way, however, I was reminded of the statement of Justice Malcolm by the Supreme Court decision we just tackled because it showed that what Justice Malcolm said is not exactly or absolutely true. While the law may indeed define power, the law does not do so all the time. In other words, the law is not always as precise and exhaustive as desired. How, and how this should be done? Then the central... Then again, it is in those instances wherein the law does not define power when the larger significance of Justice Malcolm's statement emerges. If the function of law is to define power, then the one who makes the law holds the key to power. The question then becomes, who holds this key? Justice Malcolm's insight comes full circle as we now confront, as we, as we must now confront the question, who has the power to make law? Notwithstanding the concept of legislative power being vested in Congress, a deeper historical analysis of the system of government of our country will reveal the practical truth that each of the three traditional branches of government and treaty making, and the judiciary through decision making, each of the branches of our government creates rules or laws that define power. At a higher but more basic level involving allocations, the law is silent. The branch of government, Pangilinan versus Cayetano, this depicts this reality finding themselves in one spectrum and thereby define or claim power to address the situation. From what we saw, the executive acted or spoke first and in a very loud manner through its withdrawal from the Rome Statute. The, the, the legislature or the Senate in particular chose to be silent, but perhaps it was through such silence or inaction that it was playing its part in this lawmaking or power defining moment. When called upon to address the situation and make its mark in this constitutional lawmaking exercise, the Supreme Court, in my view, essentially gave its imprimatur to the executive's action. The language and approach used may, may ostensibly convey the idea that no binding precedent is being laid down in Pangilinan versus Cayetano, which as we all know, raises a number of questions in itself. But the practical reality is that power was defined and law was made through this interaction of our in law. The Supreme Court's decision in Pangilinan versus Cayetano and the events leading to it show what in my opinion is a more realistic view. That is, that law and politics are not incompatible antagonists 
that must be kept in separate cements to balance and complete the other. Indeed, while there is much significance in Justice Malcolm's statement that the law defines power, it leaves an equally important dimension unsaid. That is, that power creates and maintains law. These closing remarks are not meant to be a sad or foreboding commentary about the state of our laws, our government, or our society. Far from this, the message I wish to convey is one of open-mindedness and affirmation. In a democracy where we value maintaining a marketplace of ideas, we must accept the fact that this will always be a marketplace of advocacies and political agendas. In an arena wherein advocacies are, or agendas clash and the situation calls for only one to succeed at the end of the day, setbacks do not extinguish the cause of the side that does not prevail. For as long as people advocate and fight for what they believe in, our democracy will be alive regardless. Let us not forget that the traditional branches of our Republican form of government are not the only movers and shakers, so to speak. Recall the beginning of our charter. We, the sovereign Filipino people. With that, and on behalf of the UP College of Law, let me thank those to whom we owe this morning's insightful discussion. Justice Antonio T. Carpio, Professors Raj Palacios, Dan Gatmaitan, and Diane Desierto. Thank you very much for your time and valuable perspectives. We hope to see and hope from you, hope to see and hear from you all again soon, including those who chimed in no, among the panelists. We also thank the Institute of International Legal Studies and the Information and Publication Division of the UP Law Center for their quick and responsive action to the call we got to stage this forum. Special thanks, of course, goes to the Justice George A. Malcolm Foundation for this initiative, for bringing to us this idea to foster discussion and debate on a recent development in our legal, political, and international landscape. The Foundation's vigilance is commendable and something that should be emulated. Finally, we thank all those who joined and watched this event. We hope you enjoyed the exchange of ideas we just, we just witnessed. We wish Fina, before we end, I just want to ask you, wasn't that such fun? Didn't you miss a yes, discussion, it was. discussion like that? <laughs> We, we should have more of this as in fact i am sure that the trustees of the foundation would like to revive the tradition of holding malcolm lectures i spoke to justice vivi mendoza and he said that he's he has a lot of memories of uh, what used to time and in fact he told me that during the time of uh, uh, Justice Feliciano, the, the justices of the Supreme, uh, as we refounder himself, Justice George Malcolm. Thank you very much to Thank you. everybody who uh, made this uh, revival a success. For a part two, right? So to our lovely audience. Definitely. <laughs> uh, right. This has been Understanding the President's Treaty Powers, Senate Concurrence and Vested Rights, under the recent Pangilinan versus Cayetano ruling, a Malcolm lecture co-presented by the UP College of Law, the UP Institute of International Legal Studies, and the Justice George Malcolm Foundation. Thank you very much and good noon to everyone. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Tina. Bravo.